Hello, and welcome to Chapter 5. Today we're going to be talking about strategies in action. So, in this chapter, we're going to discuss five characteristics and ten benefits of a clear objective. We're going to define examples of 11 types of strategies, discuss three types of integration strategies, uh, give specific guidelines when market penetration, market development, and product development are especially effective strategies, explain when diversification is an effective business strategy. We're going to um, list guidelines for retrenchment, divestiture, li liquidation, identify and discuss Porter's five generic strategies. We're going to compare cooperation among competitors. We're going to discuss tactics and we're going to explain how strategic planning difference is different for in-profit and non-profit companies. Now we're finally moving into, we have our background set up, our external internal audits. We know our, what a strategic vision and mission statement is, and we're ready to start getting into the thick of different strategies. So long-term objectives. So these are gonna be timeframes where we're moving somewhere between two and five years. Some companies have objectives that can be 10 or 20 years, but the most common is a time frame between two to five years. <clears throat> Some common objectives for more long-term consideration would be um, a general direction for the company, uh, creating synergy between the company's products or divisions, assist in evaluation, establishing priorities, reducing uncertainty, minimizing conflicts, uh, stimulate exertion, and aid in both allocation of resources and design of jobs. I'm going to talk, this is going to be tied into the rest of the lecture more specifically. Okay, so five characteristics of objectives. So, and then we're going to talk about financial and strategic objectives, but five characteristics of objectives. Um, one, that it is measurable. You can't manage it if you can't measure it. So, very important. Uh, understandability has to be clear. So your, your, your strategies have to make sense and they have to be clearly communicated. Challenge. They have to be achievable. They have to be something that does take some time and effort, but they have to be something the company can achieve. It can't be an impossible mission like populating Mars. Um, compatible has to consist uh, in a world that's going to fit the company. So it's going to be consistent with the vertical as well as horizontal <clears throat> chains of command in the company. And uh, five, it has to be realistic uh, and achievable. Okay, so let's talk about what's the difference between financial objectives and strategic objectives. Now, financial objectives are more about money, I guess. So the basic financial objectives that investors are looking for a company is one, they want to see a growth in revenues. They want to be involved with growth companies. No one likes declining companies. So the goal for companies, of course, is to expand their revenues, make new products, enhance the, the accessibility of their current products. And with the objective of not only just selling things, but selling them at a profit. Um, so companies uh, can easily increase their sales by lowering their prices especially sales units, but you always want to make a profit. So you want to charge what the market will bear. So you want to charge an appropriate price for your product that's acceptable to the market and acceptable to your corporation as far as making profits. These profits then in turn will drive decisions of how to pay dividends. The dividend should be growing and profit margins should be growing. You know, So if your profit margins were 50% last year, they should be 52% this year. They want to see a greater return on the investments the company makes. So if you're Disney and you buy Star Wars for $4 billion or Marvel for $4 billion, you want to see, a, and they've had a significant return on those investments. They bought Fox for $72 billion, I think. It's yet to determine if that's going to result in a significant uh, return on that investment. But that's what shareholders are looking at because they want these higher earnings per share and these are going to be factors that are going to increase the stock price. So financial objectives ultimately want to run the company in a way that's going to grow revenues and profits and grow stock price. And one of the best ways that's managed or tracked is how they improve cash flows. Okay, 
Strategic objectives are things like inc in improving your market share, a better on-time delivery, shorter design to market timeframes, lowering costs uh, in relationship to competitors, higher product quality compared to competitors, a bigger graphic, um, geographic coverage compared to rivals, uh, achievement, achievements in development technologies and technological leadership, uh, getting new and improved products to market ahead of rivals. So strategic objectives are more about designing, improving, implementing products, distributing profit products. It's more about the what the company has to offer and getting that to customers. So offering better products and getting them to more customers are more defined strategic objectives compared to the two are financial and strategic objectives are related is that you're not going to achieve your financial objectives unless you're achieving your strategic objectives. Um, and financial objectives, achieving them helps provide the cash flow to invest in the company and achieve more strategic objectives. So they sort of go in a, a circle around each other. Um, so when we talk about not managing by objectives, um, so uh, what we're, we're talking about here is, you know, avoiding a management uh, that's just a reaction, a reaction management. You know, there's a crisis or fire. We don't want a manager to be running around, you know, putting out fires. Um, so we want to be above that. We don't want to just react to a problem and then react to the next problem. Um, managing by hope is a little bit better, you know, than managing by crisis. So we are hopeful that future attempts or future decisions will be more beneficial. Um, so, but we still, we want to, we don't definitely, even though managing by hope is better than crisis, it's still to be avoided because we want to manage on objectable uh, achievements, achievements that can be um, reasonably successful. We don't want to just hope and pray things will work out. Um, management by extrapolation. Um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, keep doing the same things and never improving. Or managing by mystery, uh, where there's really no idea what we're doing. Uh, it's sort of, we hope things are going to work out and, you know, we just do the best we can and we hope we accomplish our goals. So we don't really, it's a mystery how we work as a company and how things are getting done. So these are management styles we definitely don't want in our strategy. So different types of strategies, not no two org organizations are going to have the same strategy, but they're going to pursue multiple strategies or different combinations of strategies to get to their objectives. Um, you, no organization can follow every strategy and they would fail trying to do everything at once. Um, so if difficult decisions have to be made, there's a certain list of priorities should be set up for the company and what they're going to follow and how they're going to move forward. And here are some different types of strategies that companies can employ that have been successful, successful for a lot of different companies. You could have a forward integration. So gaining ownership and increased control over uh, distributors and retailers. So this forward integration is really, you know, being a much more um, diverse company as far as really grabbing the control of the distribution of the products. Or uh, like you think of Amazon is a good example of this, where they have their Amazon.com and they're controlling the distribution of their goods, but they also work with other retailers and they control them too to have access to their platform. Backwards integration is seeking ownership or increasing control of the firm's suppliers. So this would be uh, um, an example here, Starbucks buying a coffee, co a coffee farm, but it could also be McDonald's who have purchased farm and potato land to, to get control over the quality of their potatoes uh, that they put in their French fries and the way they're grown and, and different aspects to how big they're going to be and how they utilize them. So to get more control over their food supply, McDonald's has actually um, purchased 
some of the um, farms that is going that feeds into their um, their products. Horizontal integration, seeking ownership or increasing control over competitors. So this is where you know you're acquiring similar competitors to get you know uh, a bigger market share and a bigger control of the industry at the same level. So it's sort of the like um, you could have a retailer buying, you know, it could be when originally when um, PepsiCo was buying Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, KFC and putting them together to make one giant um, fast food company with the idea of selling more soda, which origin, which eventually they spun off the fast food company, which is now Yum Brands. Um, market penetration, seeking to increase market share for the present products or services in the current market. So really expanding your market share and doing things that are going to get your products purchased by more people. Uh, uh, market development. So introducing present products to new markets, new geographic areas, new customers. Um, sometimes this is successful, sometimes it fails. So Walmart failed to expand into Germany, Target failed to expand into Canada. Uh, and sometimes it's very successful, like uh, Walmart's expansion into, new, into Mexico. Product development, seeking increased sales by improving uh, the present products or services or developing new ones. So this could be a car manufacturer making a car more reliable, but a better warranty. Uh, for a long time, uh, Hyundai struggled to get market share or market uh, penetration, and they developed this pioneering warranty, that, which were 10 years or 100,000 miles, thereby answering the question of, is, does this car how's the quality in this car? I don't think this car is high quality. And by guaranteeing the car for 10 years or 100,000 miles, it gave people the confidence to say, okay, they're standing behind the quality of the car and that really helped to increase the sales of that product. Uh, related diversification, adding new but related product services. So this is sort of when Facebook had, you know, bought Instagram, bought WhatsApp. So really expanding um, in, products that they think will enhance the current products. You know, it could be um, when Warner Brothers, um, Discovery purchased Warner Brothers to really extend their content and their streaming platforms. Unrelated diversification where you're buying unrelated businesses, where um, you have a business that uh, does pretty well, say it's a fast food company, and then they buy um, a chain of stores that sell clothes. You know, sometimes this is a strategy. Um, retrenchment, which is regrouping um, through sort of going backwards a little bit, reducing the scope of things, reducing their costs and asset reductions. So sometimes a retrenchment is just, okay, something's not working, let's close our unprofitable stores, let's retrench, regroup, and then um, move out again at a later date. So generally retrenchment is not taken well by investors, but for some stores that are facing the, the brunt of internet sales that, you know, they just might have to, to slow their growth and, and retrench on their number of stores open to become a little bit more prizable, profitable in a smaller size. Divestiture, you know, selling division or selling something that doesn't, doesn't work or selling something that could be a big source of capital to the company. So when Sears was having problems, it's, it, it divested its land and its division and sold that. Liquidation, when the company is just basically done and they have to liquidate the assets, this is a strategy to get the remaining value out of the company into the, the hands of the remaining shareholders. So levels of corporate strategies. Um, so you have large companies and small companies. And of course, the only difference between the large and small company might be the divisional level, where large companies tend to have multiple divisions. Uh, you know, so one large company might have 10 separate divisions, where a small company doesn't really break it itself up in divisions. But pretty much the strategy is going to be the operational level, which is just, you know, making the products, the, the production. Then you're going to have the functional level, which is going to be uh, finance, marketing, uh, research, development, manufacturing, human resources, information systems. So this is the develop. This is 
the level above the operational. So think of the operational level, the direct employees who directly make and manufacture the products and organize the inventory and the production and assembly. The functional level are people who are going to now try to account for the, the company's sales and profits and the marketing and the, you know, organize research development to make new products. Then at the top, you have the corporate level, um, which is going to be the, the leaders of the company and top management who are going to be the most responsible for making and disseminating strategies for the company. Um, so if you had like a basis of uh, annual bonus or merit pay, the corporate level, it's more about achieving long-term objectives. Uh, the divisional level would be more 50-50. Functional level, 25% uh, on long-term objectives, 75% on annual objectives, and operational, the same thing. So this is just a commonality, but not all companies are gonna follow these exact percentages, of course. Um, so let's talk about forward integration a little bit more. Um, so, you know, with forward integration, th this is trying to become, I guess, more of a vertical business. So you want to gain ownership or control of other elements of um, your business. So if you're a retailer, maybe you want to start to buy a manufacturer. Uh, so that way you can control the manufacturing of your goods as well. Um, and it's just a way to control a bigger, uh, more companies that are involved in your company being able to make goods and services and to deliver them to uh, eventual customers. It could be, you know, for, you know, you think about the Apple store. Why did, why did uh, Apple do a forward integration and gain ownership into a set of retail stores? Well, at the time, uh, most retailers were selling mostly only PC products. So in order to get Apple inside the malls or get Apple products close to the customers, Apple took matters in their own hands and opened their own retail division to help increase their distribution. Backwards integration, um, this is where you're kind of moving backwards to your suppliers. Um, so it depends. Forward integration is really where you sit on that uh, supply chain. So if you're at the very back of the supply chain, a raw material uh, producer, everything is forward integration. But if you're a retailer, everything you do to gain control of other businesses would be more backwards integration. But together, they're both pursuing both forward and backwards integration would be a vertical strategy where you want to control everything from sourcing the raw materials uh, to creating the 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 work and process materials to creating the finished goods to, to controlling distribution to getting the the products in the customer's hands now a horizontal integration is flat so you're buying other businesses at the same level you are so if you're a retailer you're buying other retailers if you're a manufacturer you're buying other manufacturers to get more control and more market share and economies of scale um so going going back to the forward integration, um, so this is all about depending where you are on the on the supply chain of the product. So if you want to, if you are just a wholesaler, you want to go ahead and and buy some retailers, to, like I always like explain with Apple to get your products into the store and take advantage of um, better distribution and get and then capture. Uh, the way it works is the wholesaler sells to the retailer, retailer sells to the customer. So the retailer makes a profit between what the retailer pays the wholesaler and what they sell to the customer. And the wholesaler makes a profit based on what they sell to the retailer. So if you control the whole process, you're keeping all the profits. So the, whole the wholesaler is selling directly to the, the customer and keeping all the retail and wholesale profits together. So that's one of the benefits of that forward integration. Now backwards integration, um, will give you the control of suppliers. So you have a better, so if you're an automobile manufacturer and you realize that there's been a, a shortage of computer chips for your vehicles, you may want to buy a semiconductor company. So you have control of the computer chips being made to go into your cars. So some of this backwards, now Apple chose not to really have a backwards integration with the assembly of their products. So they out, they do a subcontractor and outsource that to other companies to make their products like the iPhone. So they chose not to do a backwards, but to do a forward integration. 
whereas Starbucks and McDonald's did more of a backwards integration to grab you know, capital and human resources at the level of making the ingredients for their products. And this helps them to stabilize prices and increase their supplies and the reliability of their supplies uh, and react more quickly in a change in, in demand. Now the horizontal integration, which I was explaining before, just a little bit more uh, information on this is, is really trying to monopolize, but not being a monopoly per se, but trying to, you know, uh, soak up some of the smaller competitors to make your bigger organization, hopefully economies of scale will provide better profits and more competitive advantages as you become a bigger company and control a bigger portion of the share of the market. Now, uh, a market penetration strategy is you're looking to increase shares for your present products, which getting better um, access to markets and doing some better uh, market integration. And it's a pretty common strategy, I would say, um, for companies. The, hold on, let me just skip ahead for a second. Yeah, so we're gonna talk about these more in depth, the market penetration, market development, and product development strategy. So let's just talk about a little bit more about uh, product development. So, I'm sorry, product penetration. So if the current markets aren't saturated and um, you want to get deeper into that market uh, and you want, the, you want the customers, you want your customer base to grow basically. So if your market share has been declining or the industry sales, you know, has been growing while your portion of the industry's total sales have been smaller and smaller segment, you wanna, you wanna figure out a way to get, to gain better market penetration. Um, so what we're, we're talking about here is something say Coke and Pepsi uh, have done for a hundred years. So to get better market penetration for their products, they aggressively moved into every retailer that could sell soda. Even retailers where you wouldn't expect making deals. Um, you know, a lot of times these soda companies will make a deal with the university, will donate money towards the stadium. You make Coke products, the exclusive soda that be sold at this university, or they'll make a deal with uh, McDonald's. Like Coca-Cola makes a deal with McDonald's. You only sell Coca-Cola at McDonald's, you know, or, you know, you buy sh um, shelving space and pay slotting charges to put your products on guarantee shelf space for your products in different stores. So you're actually paying a retailer extra money just so you can control the shelf space. And this is all an effort to enhance this market penetration, get your product where the consumers can see it, where the consumers can buy it and grow, you know, like roots of a tree, grow your distribution network of your product into the market. So market development guidelines, um, if new channels of distribution are available, um, you want to see if you can get that, your product in that new channel of distribution. So maybe it's moving into a new, a new chain of stores. Maybe you're selling traditionally in supermarkets and you want to get into pharmacies. As there's a lot of pharmacies. Maybe you want to get into gas station convenience retailers. Um, so in order to get your product into these new markets, your organization has to have a product that's successful and that a product that people want. Um, so there can be untapped, you know, uh, markets where there's definitely a demand for your product, but it's just not easily accessible. So let's bring the product to that. A big, a big way that soda companies got their products quicker to consumers is the development of soda vending machines, where it could be placed you don't need a store anymore. The, the vending machine is its own store. And we can place this in places like workplaces or parks or, or um, uh, anywhere where people conjugate uh, to sell soda. Um, now, the, the organization, of course, has to have the ability to and the resources to expand their operations, to take advantage of these new markets, uh, to have the production capacity to, to scale up. So if you don't have enough factories, you don't have enough production capacity to move into these new markets, um, you're gonna be eclipsed by other competitors. So when Coke and Pepsi wanted to quickly move into new markets in new countries, 
uh, but it was very uh, difficult for them to scale up their domestic pro productions and very expensive to transport soda across the oceans uh, to get to uh, different countries around the world. They come up with this plan of, you know, condensing the soda into a very thick syrup and selling the syrup, which is much uh, less costly to transport and it has much less of a volume. And then at the local source, the bottler would be, uh, you would franchise the bottler, they would buy the syrup from Coke and then bottle Coca-Cola and sell it uh, uh, in their region, thereby greatly enhancing their profitability and enhancing the reach of the soda companies across the world. So product development. Um, products are con continuously changing, new products are being developed, products are becoming, some products become old and outdated and, you know, so a company has to, it has to keep running, it has to keep developing products, moving forward, it has to um, look at the industry, see what new technologies are developed, see what companies, competitors are doing, and make a product that's higher quality, meets the customer needs better, is, is, um, has a certain style to it, a demand, a coolness to it that enables the companies to compete in a high growth industry uh, at a profitable way. Um, so doing, being connected to the customer, doing a lot of research, a lot of marketing research and developing your cap capabilities to be there and have the right products at the right time for when your customers are you know, looking for more. So if you look at the car, comp car industry, every new model, every year, just like the, I guess with cell phone industry too, every year a new iPhone comes out, a new version, the 20, a, you know, 20 something car, 2024, 2025 vehicle comes out. And how is it different? Well, look, might look very similar. You know, new iPhones might look similar. The new cars might look similar, but they'll do a good job. Apple does a great job of saying, you know, we have more battery power. We have better cameras. We have better screens. We have less. Uh, screens that are harder to damage we, you know so putting all these you know from car manufacturers we can go more miles per gallon we have more safety features we have better styling we have um, products that you want electric vehicles hybrid vehicles so you see how every as car companies move forward every year when they're producing a new car it has to be more to give the consumer more and oftentimes the price doesn't go up as fast as the cost of providing all this new content But customers or consumers are always expecting more. Why should I buy a new iPhone if it's not significantly better than the previous one I had? Okay. Now there's there's a couple of things called related diversification and unrelated diversification. So um, if you're diversifying in a way that you're going to um, the strategies will align across different businesses. So which we're going to talk about more here. And then the unrelated diversification is you're, you're diversifying things that are not similar to your core business, but there's some sort of relationship that might exist. So when we're talking about related diversification, um, we're, it's something where we can take our valuable core strategic advantages and leverage it to a new, a new, a new type of product or a new uh, capacity. Um, so it, it's sort of like when a long time ago, Marvel comics bought toy biz so they could directly make action figures and play sets off their characters, or it's where, um, Disney purchased later on, then purchased Marvel. So Disney purchased Marvel cause they were both in the business related business of storytelling or leveraging characters to sell merchandising and products. So you're combining related businesses that are separate and distinct, but into one op operation that could, you know, uh, lower costs and increase customer um, product expansions. Um, you can you can uh, leverage a known brand name or distribution network. So this cross business collaboration. So when Di Marvel goes and gets together with Disney, now you have Disney's di distribution. You can be on. Disney Plus, you can be in Disney theme parks, you can be in Disney merchandising, Disney retailers. So it just really the synergy develops where it just makes sense that these two brands can come together. Disney's really good at that, as I mentioned before, buying Star Wars, buying Marvel, buying Fox, 
integrating these properties into their company's gigantic distribution of content to their um, customers. Now, continuing in related diversification. Um, so why would you want to diversify? Well, uh, if you're in a low growth or slow growth industry, it may make sense to, um, you can't really grow your sales by selling more, but you can grow your sales by getting involved in this um, related businesses. So you're adding new products to your, your company that are in related areas. And some of them might be more growth related areas. Um, but there, the key thing is that there's a connective tissue between what you're offering and what, um, what you're currently selling and the new products you're going to sell. There's something that there's a synergy that can be developed between them. Uh, so maybe you're in the supermarket business and it's a slow growth business. So you decide to diversify into um, a food manufacturer, a food processor and make your own, uh, your own label of foods. So like uh, the store, the store brand of foods to help uh, grow the business that way. And maybe also sell foods to other uh, retailers. Um, so it's new, but it's related. And the, the organization's products are currently in decline. It's going to be one of the few ways this company can continue to grow and continue to deliver more products. And since the products are related, the connectivity of the synergy between the products might, get, might make it easier. So, you know, if, you know, Keurig, which makes the uh, coffee makers and the coffee pods, if they were to buy um, Starbucks to help uh, expand their brand so then they could sell Keurigs in Starbucks, Keurig pods at Starbucks, and also sell coffee, which that's their related business, but now sell through a retailer. Not that that would ever, I don't think Keurig or Starbucks would ever um, get together, but it's not, it's certainly not a bad idea. Um, now, unrelated diversification is when the firm's going to sell new products in a significantly different unrelated field, like McDonald's selling food and then getting into manufacturing and selling tires, uh, which they, they never did that, but I'm just saying that would be an example. Uh, so if you're competing in a very competitive, no growth industry, you may just want to um, start a new bit, get into a new line, a new business that's more higher growth. So, but if you have certain channels for distribution, um, so for example, here's a better McDonald's example. When things were slowing down for McDonald's, they decided, okay, well, let's move into a, ca a cafe business. And they developed McDonald's Cafe and integrated it into their stores. And the McDonald's Cafe sell, sold, we're still going to sell, you know, um, muffins and, and other treats, as well as signature coffees and shakes and liquid uh, products um, to expand their business. And it's, it's something similar to Dunkin' Donuts where they were focused mostly on donuts and just coffee. And then later on, they, they started to move into muffins and breakfast sandwiches and hash browns. And then later to more designer coffee drinks and um, uh, drinks that were not coffee, drinks that were refreshers or fruit juices, um, things that continue to sell drinks all day long, moving away from pastries and donuts and more into selling drinks. Because pastries was a slow growth industry. But um, specialty coffees and drinks was a more uh, faster growth industry. So I guess you could say that's a related, that probably be more of a related diversification example. Um, I guess a better unrelated would be if um, Dunkin' Donuts would acquire um, uh, a clothing store company and try to sell Dunkin' Donuts fashion brands, which you see that's it's very difficult to do these unrelated diversifications because it doesn't always make sense of what the company is doing or how. And sometimes a lot of times these unrelated companies never really let the customer know that they're selling both of these products or both of these brands. Um, but they're looking really to say, okay, our current business is good. We're making money. It's a cash cow. How can we use that cash cow to buy a new hot 
smaller business or another business that's hotter, growing faster, the, the, the future. So we can really have a direction to morph our company into. It's sort of like when phone companies eventually started to do wireless, um, uh, do uh, other businesses, uh, maybe um, AT&T buying Warner Brothers, uh, which was a unrelated diversification. And AT&T did a lot of these diversifications that were unrelated and later spun them off. It could be, so like the cigarette companies bought food companies. So um, Altice bought Kraft, later they spun them off, but it was sort of this unrelated diversification to help balance a slow growth industry with, with a more stable growth industry. Um, but, you know, the company has to have significant capital and, you know, have management talent in place to operate two very different businesses. Um, so there has to be hopefully a financial synergy between how they operate and distribute these two different businesses uh, and, and some expertise. So, you know, cigarette companies had an expertise in selling products. So when they moved into food companies, they wanted to leverage that expertise of their marketing and distribution onto some food items as well. Um, but the one thing you don't have to worry about as much in unrelated diversification um, is that uh, antitrust action. So if you're too related in your diversification, you may become a monopoly and antitrust could affect where the government wants to break up your company as unrelated diversification is not going to be so much of an issue because there's not going to be a monopolistic effect if you're operating in companies that are more conglomerates and operate in different, different fields. Okay, let's talk about uh, defensive strategies, retrenchment, divestiture, and liquidation. So retrenchment is basically, you have to pull back and regroup, uh, reduce your assets, reduce your exposure, and hopefully come up with a turnaround plan and relaunch. Uh, and speaking about Dunkin' Donuts before, they actually did this before where the company was acquired through, the, um, through venture capital, they closed a number of stores, they retrenched, became profitable, redesigned their products, found a formula that worked, and then expanded again. So this is a not uncommon thing for companies to do when you know, things are not working, pull back a little bit, get the company stabilized in its financials, start making a profit, spend some money redesigning the products, and then when they have uh, growth-oriented products, they can spring up again and um, get out of that sort of you know, sort of like a turtle going into its shell to protect itself. A company can pull back into its shell and focus on its core businesses, uh, get stabilized, get enough capital together, and then um, spring out again. So retrenchment is not, um, is a def the defensive strategy, but sometimes a strategy that was quite often pretty successful for a lot of businesses. Um, so, if a company is, you know, reasons for a company to do retrenchment is if they failed in a particular meeting their goals, if they're one of the lower performing competitors in the industry, uh, if they have, you know, inefficiencies, production problems, if they're not, if they haven't capitalized on, or they made bad decisions on what the market direction, the current opportunities, um, they've made some, some bad decisions that led to losses and led to the decline of their, of their once a uh, highly profitable brand. This is reasons why you want to retract, correct, and then move forward again. Sort of like retreating in, on the battlefield. Now, a divestiture is a little bit different. This is where um, you want to take a particular division, a particular aspect of your company, um, and you um, you want to get rid of it. So there's some kind of division or product group, or it just doesn't fit the company or what the company's goals are, and you want to divest yourself of that investment. And sometimes it generates enough enough cash. You know, for example, going back to McDonald's again, at one point they wanted to divest, they wanted to diversify away from McDonald's. So they bought um, a pizza chain restaurant. They invested heavily in Chipotle Mexican Grill, and at a certain point they realized, okay, let's divest let's divest ourselves of these external other companies. They also purchased uh, Boston Market. So at a certain point they said, okay, let's sell these companies, sell Boston Market, 
sell our investment in Chipotle Mexican Grill, sell the, the, the pizza chain, take this money, let's reinvest it in the operations of our most successful brand, McDonald's. Um, uh, regenerate the product line, regenerate the, and rebuild the look of the restaurants and just, re, just reinvest in the core company. So that divestiture of McDonald's really helped propel the company forward as it focused on the McDonald's brand itself and expanding McDonald's uh, products and distribution and restaurants. So a divestiture isn't a failure. It's like a corrective course. We tried something new. We got a new, into a new business. It didn't work well. Over, it didn't work overall so well. We're going to get out of that and move into something else or expand our key, our key businesses instead and can use the cash from divesting to pay down debt or invest in new, uh, new business, a new elements of a current business, or even maybe a new business. Um, but then there's liquidation. This is really your business is done. It's failed. Um, we got to pay off, sell our assets, pay off our liabilities and return the, the, the money to our current investors. It's just the last move of a, of a company that's, that's going to die. Um, so organizations, they, um, if, you know, retrenchment and diversification didn't work, they weren't successful and bankruptcy staring them down they probably the best thing to do is go ahead and liquidate and try to get whatever remaining value there is for their shareholders. Okay, uh, a value chain analysis and benchmarking. So these are these are a couple of processes that we're gonna um, talk about. So a value chain analysis. This is basically where the firm determines what their value is minus their costs. So. Um, they're looking at all the activities that when it's producing and marketing a product and, you know, from very beginnings of purchasing the raw materials to the labor to manufacture, distributing the product, marketing the product and getting that into the hands. So where is, where is the value? You know, um, so we take away the costs of all this work, um, and we, we take the sales price from the cost and we have basically our profit margin. But we want to develop an idea of the, the value. So a customer's perspective really is the price you pay for something and the value you get from it. So why is Apple able to manufacture a cell phone for $200 and sell it for $1,000? Because the people buying it find such great value in the, their cell phones, in the apps, the efficiencies of the apps, the organizational power of, of the calendar, the email, the cell phone, the camera, everything there being in one place. The benefits to people of having an all-in-one computerized tool in their pocket um, is tremendous. So that's why they're willing to pay a price much higher than the cost of the product. And Apple is able to make a product that has significant value over competitors that enable them to have this price leadership. So if you, if you look at their, you know, their value chain, um, you know, they do um, a pretty good uh, organization of procuring the components, having them manufactured, uh, making a superior, and their real competitive advantage is their, their research development design of their products, making just superior products, and then, you know, building them in, in a high quality way, and then pushing them out to an, a, a elaborate distribution network of their own stores and other retailers, uh, including, you know, besides the Apple stores, you have the electronic stores like Best Buy, and then you have all the cell phone stores, T-Mobile, Sprint, uh, Verizon, AT&T, all selling iPhones too. So you have literally thousands of stores selling their products. It's just a brilliant value chain. Now, benchmarking is where, um, it's another, it's another tool where you want to really look at how you're doing compared to competitors. So you want to benchmark yourself to maybe the industry averages or the best practices and get a better idea of how you're performing among your competitors. So, um, so if we look at, a, a, here's an illustration of a value chain. So the company, the suppliers, the distribution, the customers, these are all um, aspects of the company. So this is what forms their value chain and hopefully they're creating value the company is creating value for their suppliers in the way that they're able to take the you know the goods from the suppliers and sell them at a at a profit and the distribution is they can get these products into the customer's hands and the customers are satisfied that the product has value over the price that they're paying for it um, 
here's an actual uh, example of a value chain from um, supplier costs. So as far as a typical manufacturing suppliers, they're getting the raw materials, whether it's uh, ingredients, uh, sugar, uh, corn, oil, gas. This is then that's involved in the fuel and energy, transportation, the trucks, the maintenance, the inspection, the storage, the warehouse, all supplier costs. Then production, inventory systems, receiving, maintenance, plant location, uh, computer systems, research, development, cost accounting. To the distribution, loading, shipping, budgeting, personnel, internet tracking, railroads, fuel, maintenance. These are all things that along the whole way, every step the company wants to create value or save money or do something better to make them more competitive and more retain more of the profits. Okay. So transforming a value chain activity to sustain competitive advantage is basically you, we know the activities in a value chain. So identifying and assessing, you know, what are we doing well and turning them into core competencies where the where Apple is great at distributing, having a great distribution network for their phones. Coke and Pepsi have strong distribution networks for their sodas, strong um, uh, franchises to make their sodas around the world and, you know, um, evolving these core companies into a distinctive competency. So Coke and Pepsi are so good at buying shelf space in the supermarket, very few other brands can get their new products, new sodas onto the market because Pepsi and Coke control it so much, they keep a lot of brands from even reaching the consumer's hands by controlling the vending machines, the supermarket shelves, the pharmacy shelves, just wherever soda is sold, Coke and Pepsi are working to make its distinctive competency of blocking other soda companies from getting access to these stores. Um, and then these eventually yield a sustained competitive advantage where, you know, the company is just known for producing great content. Disney's known for producing great animation films and family films. Um, that's just consumers just think, what is the high quality product in this, in this, in this market? And there's usually one or two manufacturers you go to for saying this is the high quality. Um, so if we look at Porter's generic strategies, this is some generic strategies that companies can follow that help to distinguish themselves from competitors and just have a strategy where they can connect with consumers. So cost leadership is one of those strategies where we wanna be a low cost provider. So our low cost strategy is to provide customers with the lowest price possible. Um, so that is, you know, if you look at the vitamin industry, there are high in vitamins you can get at health food stores that are 60 to hundred dollars for a bottle of multivitamins. And then there are multivitamins you can buy at Walmart for $7. So that would be the low cost strategy. And there can also be a narrow to focus low cost strategy that products and services offer to a very small range of customers, at the lowest price possible. So the idea is for certain products like vitamins. There are people who, who want to just really invest in the low end. Some people want sort of, out of the middle end, like product, vitamin products sold at Costco or high end vitamin products sold at specialty stores. And there's a market for all these three areas, depending on the customer's perspective, just like cars do this too. There could be an economy level car, entry level economy class car and a premium or luxury car. So different strategies. So the cost leadership is one way, sell um, products at a low price. Differentiation strategy is aimed at producing products and services that are considered unique, industry-wide and directed at consumers are relatively price sensitive. So this is another type of strategy that is similar to the lower cost strategy, but it's a way to, um, um, how can I say, you want to have a wide market, right? So having um, is, I guess, you know, there can be kind of different types of this diversification, a wide or narrow target market. So in the, in the wide market, um, we have strategies and, and, you know, things we want to reach everybody, but it's sort of a more of a, a, a niche. So if you think of, we're talking about beverages before sodas, you might think of like monster beverage where, it's, it's a differentiation because it's an energy drink uh, and they want to mark, but they want this to be a wide availability. Um, the having a little bit more of a target market, it, a more narrow focus 
is offering something that is going to be different. It's not going to really appeal to a lot of people, but it's going to be a cost level that's going to be appropriate for a certain subset of the, a group of people. Um, okay. The other means for achieving strategies, build, grow from within, borrow, um, grow from others or buy others to grow. So let's talk about each of, um, let's talk about each of these a little bit more. So if you want to build, this means that you are going to build from within. So you're not going to buy another company. You're not going to acquire another company. You're going to, um, use your own internal resources, your own core competencies and competitive advantages to grow and build your company organically. Um, sort of like, you know, Netflix, they didn't want to rely on outside companies for their content. So they wanted to build their own production um, facilities and negotiate directly and build and buy their own content for their platform. Now, borrowing from others to grow, um, this could be through joint ventures or strategic alliances where you work with other companies to get your products in their stores to work together on a combined product. So sometimes joint ventures are a way for companies to get together and share their strengths to increase their market penetration, their competitive advantages, um, and compete against larger competitors. To borrow is to buy other companies to grow. So a lot of the growth at Microsoft, Oracle, uh, Google, our Alphabet, has been, and one of the reasons they changed the name from Google to Alphabet is because they've been buying a family, uh, a, uh, an alphabetical size amount of other companies. Every letter of the alphabet is a different starting letter of a different company Google may have purchased. So Oracle, um, Microsoft, two other examples of companies that have just bought dozens and dozens of, of smaller competitors, smaller innovators uh, that they can add to their own distinctiveness. Think of like, there was a show Star Trek where they had this villain called the Borg that wanted to assimilate. So this buy, buy others to grow is like an assimilation. Like you go and you assimilate these other companies and put them in the hole of your company to make them bigger. Let's talk about some reasons why companies can have a failed merger acquisition. So this is always very difficult for two different companies to come together. It's like a marriage. They have different company cultures, different competitive strengths, different uh, leadership styles. So sometimes the integration um, up and down uh, the value chain of, of two companies just doesn't work well and it fails. Um, sort of like when, this, when Discovery bought Warner Brothers, their management styles uh, even though their value chains uh, look like they should sync up, they actually, when they, it looked like Discovery's borrowed too much money to acquire Warner Brothers and had to do um, significant cost cutting, which, you know, we the, the merger hasn't failed yet, but the acquisition, it's more of an acquisition because they bought Warner Brothers from AT&T. And this seems to be failing right now. So that's number two. They took on too much debt um, when they acquired Warner Brothers. And now they're canceling projects or cutting costs, which is inhibiting Warner Brothers streaming platform to remain competitive in a world where Disney and Netflix are pumping out new IP, new projects, new shows continu continuously. So if you don't, your platform, your streaming platform is only as good as the new content, the new buzz that you're generating. So if two companies are failed to achieve synergy, I think one of the problems between Discovery and Warner Brothers is that Discovery was more of a reality shows, inexpensive shows, uh, cooking shows, uh, contest game shows, um, where Warner Brothers were more high quality comedy, dramas, movies. So they, so far the, there was an inability for them to synergize these two very distant groups. And, and when they're in the future, I guess they're looking to make one platform, one streaming platform of the two services. I'm not sure if the two different groups of people are interested in that same content. So the synergy may not really make a combined platform something that's more valuable to current streamers who pay for it. So if you're paying for HBO Max and they're going to raise the price three, four dollars a month because they're combining it with Discovery Plus, you're going to say that it's not worth it. I'm dropping the whole thing where Disney is a little bit smarter. So when they, they own most of Hulu, 
and they own ESPN, but when they combined those three streaming services into one platform, they still gave consumers the ability to buy only Hulu or only Disney or only ESPN. Uh, because a lot of people who, who have Disney Plus have no interest in watching sports. So that could be an issue. So in the case of too much diversification, when McDonald's was acquiring all those other food companies or in, uh, invested interest in other food companies, they over diversified. They weren't able to, to do um, make Boston Market great or make uh, their pizza their pizza franchise great like they did with their McDonald's brand. So they over diversified and they were getting to areas where they didn't have strengths. So they retrenched, which was smart. Um, difficulty to integrate different organizational cultures. So when especially when two large companies come together oftentimes there has to be a lot of layoffs for that for, to get this synergy so you don't if two big companies come together and each company has 20 people in the payroll department they could probably survive with just 20 people for the entire company so a lot of people get laid off and the way that generally leaves a bad taste in a lot of employees it lowers morale and then if company cultures are significantly different and they bring these cultures together that could um, significantly damage the integration. I remember I worked for a American uh, um, company that made at the time they were making Internet uh, cards and chips to enable computers to access the Internet. And a Taiwanese company bought the American company because they wanted access to distrib better distribution to American retailing stores. Uh, and, and access to an American brand name, which was a smart decision. However, the Taiwanese culture and company uh, clashed with the American culture. So a lot of the better employees left rather than dealing with the new culture that they didn't, they didn't understand or didn't feel comfortable in. And uh, this significantly impacted the company to the point where they had to retrench and divest themselves of of the company because it just the merger failed basically mostly on cultural differences uh, and that can happen when you have uh, a foreign company buying a domestic company so you, not only do you have different cultures of the companies you may have different cultures of the different societies so and this can reduce employee morale like i was talking before due to rail layoffs or relocation if they're closing up plants and moving people to condense their operations it's very tricky to do this and keep everyone happy. But there are a lot of potential benefits for the mergers or, uh, or acquisition. So just to name a few, uh, improved capacity utilization, meaning, you know, if you have factories that are idle, you're not you're running at 70 percent of the time. You can bring this new these new products in and you know, operate your capacity of these factories at 100 percent. Better use of existing sales force. Now the sales force has more products to sell. They have a better catalog. And so uh, salespeople become more effective. You can reduce the managerial staff, save some money on the higher paid managerial, gain the economies of scale. So suddenly now you're buying twice the amount of raw materials and negotiating for supplier discounts based on the size of the scope of the projects you're purchasing. Um, you can smooth out seasonal trends. So if you're a company that maybe you're a company that makes Christmas goods, maybe you're like the Christmas store. So your season is really in the fall and um, early winter and you buy a pool chemical or a pool dish manufacturing company or a pool retailer that can help smooth out those seasonal trends. Gain access to new suppliers, distributors, customers, products, and creditors. So if you're buying another company that significantly has, say maybe you're a domestic company that makes soup and you're buying an international soup company, now you have access to, to distribute your products internationally and their products domestically. Um, gain access to new technology. This is what Microsoft, Apple, Oracle, Google do a lot when they acquire the companies, mainly not for their personnel, it's not for their products, it's for their technology. Um, that's what Netflix and uh, actually, you know, Disney Plus did when they were before they made their streaming company. They bought a number of companies that had technology and streaming and um, sending video through the Internet. Uh, gain market share, easy way to gain. Obviously, a no brainer here. You buy a competitor, you're gaining your market share. Enter global markets. I just did a soup example before. If you want to get into global markets, you buy a, a global company that's a competitor. 
can reduce tax obligations if you're uh, distributing, you know, your headquarters to a new or lower tax state or lower tax country. And maybe it also the benefit of eliminating comp competitors. So you el eliminate one competitor. That's one less company you have to compete against. Uh, benefits from a firm being a first mover. So a first mover is really you're the first one to market with a new product. Um, so so you you can ex you can you know establish yourself um, more earlier on as far as committing getting um, guarantees from suppliers and contracts from distributors. You can um, gain new knowledge and critical success factors and issues in a new market, a new area gain market share, get the, you know, since if your product's the first mover, it's the first one to offer this type of service or the solution, you're going to have access to get into the store. So for example, in the beverage world, a new soda wasn't getting anybody anywhere, but a company came up with something called vitamin water, which was not a soda, not quite a water, a sort of a new entity altogether. It was a beverage that had nutritional content, but was sort of also thought of as a little bit more healthier. So it was, it was a water, but that sold more like a soda. So this was a new innovation, even small things like this, the development of a product called vitamin water, which led to a whole host of new flavored waters that eventually um, something similar was a Gatorade, which was a hydration. Uh, so it was not not really the same nutritional side as vitamin water, but more of a hydrational drink for sports enthusiasts and exercisers, not a soda, not an unhealthy beverage. I mean, probably is unhealthy beverage, both of them, but their market is healthier than soda. So this was a first mover advantage that gained, got them onto store shelves because they weren't soda. So they weren't being excluded by Coke or Pepsi because it was a different product. It was being stocked in the water aisle, not the soda aisle. Um, something new for customers to buy along with soda. Uh, and there's a ability, you move in, you get this, I mean, Gatorade was so strong as being a first mover that their long-term relationships with customers, suppliers, distributors made it impossible for Coke or Pepsi to compete. Eventually, Pepsi gave up and just bought Gatorade, I think for maybe $12 billion. I could be wrong about that. But uh, this was a way for Pepsi to easily gain uh, customer loyalty and commitments by and just giving up on their sports drinks and you know getting into the Gatorade business um, but also uh, benefits of being a first mover you can apply for the patents and get patent or trademark protections much earlier on your product your product name um, so man strategic management for nonprofit or smaller firms this is uh, a whole different game if you're a nonprofit. So your strategy is a little bit different. Your, your strategies aren't all wrapped around how to make a profit. And since you're not really paying, generally not paying taxes or paying very little taxes, your strategies are going to be quite different. Um, so nonprofits don't have shareholders to please. Uh, they don't have shareholders that provided capital. Nonprofits are, are a company that's doing something more beneficial to, for, for society, whether it's education or housing or uh, providing services to the elderly. Nonprofits are not there to make a profit for shareholders. They're there to, to hopefully solve a critical societal need um, in a way that they're gonna get tax advantages or incentives from governments or states to, to provide these products that might be unprofitable for corporate companies to really pr provide. So their strategies are more about um, how to um, fill uh, a demand that most um, companies aren't going to bother with. So definitely a lot of educational businesses are non-for-profit. There could be a lot of uh, small firms that help the poor, feed the hungry. Uh, there could be more charitable related businesses. So their, their mission is more about, you know, stretching their, their resources to meet the demands or needs of their customer base with not necessarily making profits number one, really making uh, what they're providing to their customers number one. I guess, of course, doing it in a way that's sustainable to them as a business. Uh, so that's a whole different methodology and a whole different set of strategies when you're talking nonprofit. Okay, so that's the end of chapter five. 
Uh, thank you for joining me for this presentation, and I look forward to talking to you in Chapter 6, which is going to be more strategy analysis and choice. Thank you.